<laughs> What's the time over there, by the way? Where are you? Where it you is currently? twelve fifteen. I'm in New York. Oh, amazing, amazing. So, uh, you know, uh, firstly, thank you very much for taking the time and you know spending your Saturday morning ish uh, <laughs> with this. Uh, I've been up since eight. So. Oh wow! Oh wow! Do you do you usually work during the the you know the weekends as well? I do. I my mother says I work twenty hours of every day. <laughs> um, but yeah, I work on weekends too. I'm able to catch up a little more on the weekend. Yeah, I I can imagine you know with uh, with your work and everything that you're doing, there's not really like a conventional rest day. You no. know. <laughs> oh, do no. you, do you, I, does this get overwhelming or are you now like currently completely synced with this dynamic or how do you feel about that? You know, uh, three years ago, um, my mom came to visit and then wound up having health difficulties. And yeah. then I had to move her in with me because she couldn't live alone anymore mm -hmm. so not only do i have like the job that i do i also have my mother full-time to take oh, care of oh i see i see so getting used to that I, i mean i don't even know if that's possible i i i have to be really organized to get everything done mm -hmm. but you know <laughs> i i manage somehow i don't know <laughs> <laughs> it seems, uh, you know, especially since uh, uh, from looking at your resume and everything that you've been working on and you've worked on, it seems that you're doing pretty great in terms of organization and managing everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trying. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that you are like naturally well organized and managed person or is this like a quality you have developed, you know, for your life? I know where everything is and I know what I have to do. It's all in here. I wish yeah. I could like write it out somewhere <laughs> and then check things off a list. Yeah. But for some reason, all the juggling just happens in my head. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I've learned that I have to take care of things as soon as they come about mm -hmm. or else I'm never going to get to them. Yeah. That's actually, you know, a, a very good lesson that, Usually people learn the hard way. Uh, I personally did it like that. So I, I completely know what you mean. Um, yeah. So um, let's start, you know, uh, let's start in, get just a little back in time because um, um, I'd be really interested to hear your side of the story in terms of, you know, um, how did you achieve the professional level at, you know, at your current niche that you're currently at? Um, and, you know, I'm very curious to hear whether, you know, your career path was something um, that you were always planning on and that you were always striving for or whether it was more of a, you know, coincidence and just a result of different, um, you know, uh, different life choices and situations and so on. I've known what I wanted to do since I was 13. Mm -hmm. So, um <laughs> And that's, wow, 40 years ago. So <laughs> Amazing, yeah. Um, I had seen a movie mm -hmm. called The Idol Maker. Mm -hmm. and, like, I've always been a huge music fan, but yeah. I have zero musical talent. <laughs> and I always wondered how I might fit into the world of music. Mm -hmm. But I never, I didn't, like, when I was younger, I didn't really have any reference for that. Mm -hmm. And I saw this movie and it was about a guy in Brooklyn who made all his um, neighborhood like guys that could sing into big stars. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I guess I could do something behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And that's when I knew I was going to be in the music business. Mm -hmm. And everything I did from there on out kind of led mm -hmm. to that. Um, when I went to college, I went to the college with the second biggest radio station in the country, mm -hmm. college radio wise, uh, Albany, SUNY Albany, it, the station was WCDB. Mm -hmm. Um, and I spent a lot of time at the radio station. I was promotions director wow. and I wrote for music magazines. So, um, I 
I always knew that this was what I wanted. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of a circuitous way to get there that I took, but mm-hmm. <laughs> I got there and, uh, you know, it, it was all very intentional. I see. I see. Um, so how would you say, you know, your passion for music started? Why right? do you have a distinctive memory that, you know, you saw or you heard something and you were like, well, this is what I want to do and I want to be associated with? I would say listening to like my my prime time of growing up was in the 80s yeah and i listened to a lot of wax tracks mm-hmm. releases mm-hmm. and that kind of music spoke to me in a really powerful way mm-hmm. um i i mean everything they put out was like oh oh i love that i love that you yeah. know and um for a while, I was like, I'm going to move to Chicago and I'm going to work at Wax Tracks. And that just <laughs> never came about. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, that kind of music, like industrial, like dance kind of stuff, like Tam FDM, yeah. Chris and Cozy, uh, Front 242, Frontline Assembly, yeah. like all of that kind of music. I was like, wow, I really like that. That's a kind of music that really speaks to me. That's that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, have you experienced like a surreal moment where, you know, with your career, you've achieved something or you've worked with a specific artist that you have never thought it would be possible back in your days where you were imagining a career in music? A lot. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. In fact, one of my best friends is Maria Ferrero from Adrenaline PR. Yeah, yeah. And she, uh, Ministry is my favorite, nice. favorite, favorite forever. Um, and one day she called me and she was like, we're going out for dinner. And I was like, oh, I'm tired. I want to go home. And she's like, no, no, no. We're going out for dinner. And you don't say no to Maria. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I met, she gave me an address to meet her. Mm-hmm. And I get there and I see Paul Barker in front Whoa. of me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. And then I saw Al Jorgensen and Al Jorgensen like puts his arm around me. And I'm Whoa. like, <laughs> This is crazy. Like, <laughs> wild. Uh, I, I can imagine that. Uh, I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can imagine you went through quite a lot of this sort of starstruck moments considering the list of projects and musicians that you've worked with. Well, that- I, I haven't had a lot of moments like yeah. that. And I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very honest. Yeah. I did not grow up a rock fan. Yeah. I was a fan. I I mean, I like Wax Tracks and TVT happened kind of down the line, uh, but I didn't really consider that rock. Yeah. Like to me, that was industrial and that was different. Like yeah. I work in the world of rock and metal now. If you said to me, do you like metal? <laughs> Actually, this is the best way to explain it. Mm-hmm. I had my interview at Roadrunner Records in 1997 mm-hmm. and I sat down with Case Wessels. And he said to me, do you like metal? And I said, not really. It doesn't matter what I like. And he was like, hmm. And I said, well, I know who likes metal. I know what they, where they read, what they read, where they go, you know, and that's what you need for the job. I don't need to be a fan. But what I didn't realize was the breadth of what people call metal. Like, all right, to me, Fear Factory was industrial. I was a fan. To me, typo negative was goth, and I was a huge fan of there. Mm-hmm. And I wound up being really good friends with that band. Whoa, wow! Like I, I spent a lot of time with typo negative, <laughs> um, and and I'm still dear friends with Johnny and Kenny. I came to realize over the years that metal meant many different things, mm-hmm. and so yeah, I kind of was a metal fan, but I didn't realize it. Like, to me, when you asked me, are you a metal fan? It was, do you like Slayer and do you like Metallica? And I still don't really care for those. Yeah, this makes sense, to be fair. Yeah, it's not for me, but Mm -hmm. I know who likes them and I respect them because they've been around forever and they're doing it, like, at a high level. That's, That's a very interesting point because, you know, obviously, as you've mentioned, you have a very good professional um, overview in terms of the industry and you know, uh, 
uh, the tendencies in the audiences and what they read and how they are being influenced and so on and so forth. I, I'm just curious to hear how, you know, because I can imagine that some people have questioned your understanding on this matter based on the fact that you might not have been a big fan. You know, I, I can imagine people being quite well, how you can understand that if you, you know, if you're not into the music. Um, but I think you can only understand it if you're not into the music. Mm -hmm. Like to me, you can only be objective. Like there were some bands at Roadrunner that weren't metal bands that I was a big fan of. Mm -hmm. They didn't do very well. Mm -hmm. Like the Sheila Divine mm -hmm. was a release off Roadrunner and it was an alt rock release and it didn't do very well. Mm -hmm. And I was upset because I thought it was the greatest record. I still <laughs> listen to that record now. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great album. Yeah, by the way. Yeah. And Junkie XL. Mm -hmm. I worked, uh, you know, Junkie XL Saturday Teenage Kick. I thought that was like the best record I ever worked, but it didn't do what it, I thought it could have done. So I feel like you can only really be objective if you're not like a rabid fan. Absolutely. And there's a difference between being a fan and being a publicist. Absolutely. And, you know, I was really interested to hear your take on that because, you know, um, and I don't know what your opinion on the matter is, but it seems that especially when it comes to, you know, metal or rock day, so there are a lot of prejudices, especially when it comes to the business aspect. And there's, you know, people are so much limiting and associating the potential and the professional expertise of people based on their personal preferences that, you know, as you've mentioned, is an aspect that it shouldn't matter to that extent. And it's not something that happens in other sort of musical genres and niches and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, um, that's, that's a definitely a very, you know, um, interesting topic that um, I, I like to hear your op opinion on, you know, on an experienced professional such as yourself. And it had to, and the fact that it was very cut and dry for me, mm -hmm. like I would go till the third song of a set mm -hmm. when all the photographers had to leave mm -hmm. and I'd leave too. Yeah. They didn't need me there. Yeah. You know, and I got plenty of sleep and I went to work the next morning and could get a lot done. I mean, yeah. you know, if I was a fan, I would have wanted to stay for the whole set. And sometimes I did. Don't get mm -hmm. me wrong, mm -hmm. because I'm a fan of the people in metal. Yes. Yes. The thing that I noticed after taking the job at Roadrunner mm -hmm. was there were no better, harder working people than in the hard rock genre. Yes. Yes. And I fell in love with that. And that I'm a tremendous fan of. I'm a tremendous fan of so many of the people I've worked with. Rob Flynn from Machine Head, Whoa. Clown from Slipknot. You know, it just, it was a great experience mm -hmm. in the seven years I was at Roadrunner. And that really just, that made me love metal. That's, uh, that's you know, so well said because, as you said, people in the charisma of the personalities in this niche are just absolutely, you know, outstanding. And it's, uh, many, I guess not many people are fortunate enough to just experience what it's like to even just communicate with these people and to, you know, it's so inspiring and motivational personally for me. So uh, I can imagine for you being in touch with such significant figures is, is very much, uh, you know, the same. Well, and also I had worked in other genres. I'd mm -hmm. worked in hip hop and pop. Mm -hmm. And those people didn't work as hard as the people in metal did. Oh, interesting. You know, I mean, those people, it was more like lifestyle oriented. And I just, you know, you would ask them to do something. They would show up late. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my rock bands, they wanted to win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and they would do what was asked of them in order to win mm -hmm. that's uh yeah this uh makes all the sense and um you know um i've been going through your resume and your list of clients and everything that you've worked on and um I, honestly there are so many things that uh, i want to ask you because from seeing this list you're pretty much you know worked on 
um, <laughs> almost every album that has influenced me personally significantly. Oh. So um, I'm interested to hear what, like, what are your, I, I'd say, proudest moments in terms of projects that you've worked on, something that, you know, have influenced you and, you know, uh, maybe you, you're proud of in showcasing to other people when it comes to your work. A lot of my proudest moments are with Slipknot. Amazing, yeah. Um, because we went from day one mm-hmm. with them. I mean, their first Ozfest show, I was there. Wow. So, you know, it's like when I got them on The Tonight Show. Like, oh, wow. to me, that was huge, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, when I got them on the cover of Alternative Press, mm-hmm. that was Actually, that was the first magazine cover I had ever gotten. The The wild thing is they're really hard workers, too. And I felt like we came up together almost. Mm-hmm. And with Nickelback, too. I mean, Nickelback seemed a lot more. A lot more made for the TV stuff. Mm-hmm. But I had them on The Tonight Show a few times and mm-hmm. I had them on Conan and I had them, you know, and like I went to award shows with Nickelback, like mm-hmm. Some of the craziest like achievements were with those two bands. And there's, you know, I have a soft spot for both. Like I matured as an as a publicist and as a marketing person and as a music executive with those two bands. Mm-hmm. That, this is amazing, you know. Um, what would you say? you know, are the most difficult or the most valuable lessons that, you know, you've learned through this whole process, especially, uh, you know, in the early years of developing yourself as a professional and being in the middle of the development of what we can call in a retrospective such significant project? I've learned that it's not about you. That's Mm -hmm. what I've learned. Like, it's not about me. Um, even some stuff that happens, like you have to assume that someone either doesn't realize how you see things or like doesn't, isn't thinking about you when they do something, because I think a lot of times, and and that comes with age too, like in the, in your twenties, you think everything's about you. There are, you know, everybody's kind of trying to get through the day. Yeah. And not everyone thinks about you when they make a statement or do a thing Mm -hmm. or, you know, so some things that you think like you were being offended or you were being left out or whatever, it wasn't intentional. And that's Mm -hmm. something you have to realize through time. You do realize that. But that's a sorry. That's (laughs) That's a big lesson I learned was that it's not about you. Yeah, and I guess this is, you know, a very valuable mindset to whatever you do anyway, you know, because at some point, I guess this can hinder your objectiveness and just being professional towards something. You've worked with, you know, so many artists and and such a big amount of music. And would you say that it's important for what you do to actually, you know, enjoy the product? And, you know, we, we sort of covered that uh, earlier, but I mean, do you think that you can do your best work if you don't think the product is good enough? Or do you well, manage the, you know, to make it work? I'm also a terrible judge of these things. Okay. So, I mean, I, when, when they played How You Remind Me for me, mm-hmm. I was like, is that the hit? And they well, were like, yeah. Wow. So I, I, that, that's what taught me I don't know what a hit is. <laughs> yeah. So... But the thing is, personal opinion, it's so subjective. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just need to know why the people that like it think it's good. Mm -hmm. And if I know that, I can do my job really well. That's that's such an interesting perspective. And, you know, I'm asking you because uh, I've talked with many people, especially when it comes to, you know, big projects sort of starting uh, from the ground. And I'm curious to, you know, I was curious to hear whether um, you can sort of pinpoint, you know, a, a hit, as you've mentioned, or something that would be, become very influential on the spot. Not me. Mm-hmm. I'm not good at that. 
<laughs> what I'm good at is finding out who's going to like something and finding the people that will like it and getting it to them. Interesting. That's pretty much what I'm good at. I can't, I'm not an A&R person. Like mm-hmm. I decided to manage a band recently mm-hmm. and they're, they're called all the pretty things. Mm-hmm. And I heard their music and I instantly fell in love with it. Mm-hmm. And something told me, okay, it's time because I'd been asked to manage bands before that, but I'd never wanted to do it. These guys, I, it, something just hit me with them. Mm-hmm. Something hit me, something said, you know, uh, you. this is the band you want to work with. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a very, you know, uh, interesting outlook. And you've mentioned that, you know, you are good in terms of um, associating a certain product to its respective audience and mm-hmm. making sure that you're putting the right things to the right people. Um can you walk me through this process for you? Is it like based on intuition? Is it a gut feeling? Is it a sort it's of research? It's research. It's research. Like when I hear a band, I guess let me liken it to what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. Now I work a lot of diverse stuff, mm-hmm. but if I hear it and something about it excites me, mm-hmm. then I say yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm working a band out of Japan called Man with a Mission. Mm -hmm. They they're wolves. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) they wear wolf masks. I think I have worked (laughs) almost every band that wears a mask. (laughs) It's wild. In the beginning with Slipknot, people thought it was a gimmick. Mm -hmm. And people were like, oh, what are they, insane clown posse? And I'm like, Mm -hmm. no, I don't accept that. You need to listen to the music. Because when you listen to the music, you'll get it. Don't go on looks alone. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but I thought that the wolf thing was very interesting. And they do a lot of anime soundtrack mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. And I love anime and I've worked on Comic Cons. Oh, wow. So that's why I work with that band from Japan. Um, mm-hmm. I'm working with a band from India now mm-hmm. that uh, called Bloody Wood that combine like traditional Indian sounds with metal. And that's so interesting to me. I love Indian music. So, you know, that's, everything's got some hook. mm -hmm. So when I find that hook, for instance, with the Japanese wolves, Man Mm -hmm. with a Mission, um, I go to my Comic-Con lists Mm -hmm. and I say, this is different. It's music coverage, yes, but they're the soundtrack to every anime thing that you love. Whoa. So, you know, and so I can work them that way. Yeah, I can do straight up music stuff, but Mm -hmm. there needs to be more than just this is good music Mm -hmm. because that's not enough, unfortunately, these days. Absolutely. It seems it's way more. And, you know, I actually would love to... You know, to hear your thoughts and um, outlook on the current state in the music business, pretty much, and the, the different tendencies in it. But it seems it gets, you know, more entertainment and less music these days, to put it very, you know, uh, briefly, I guess. Well, I think when you do something, and, and being a manager now has taught me this, mm-hmm. when you do something, you have to do it because it entertains you. Mm-hmm. And you love it. Mm-hmm. And you would do it if it never made you a penny. Mm-hmm. Because if you're not doing it for those reasons, you're in for a lot of trouble mm-hmm. and a lot of heartache. Mm-hmm. Um, because this band that I'm working with, All the Pretty Things, they have been in bands before. In fact, one of them's still in another band. I, uh, the drummer is in Alasana. Oh, amazing. And and the guitar player was in He Is Legend. And, oh, wow. you know, they, they, they've been around. Mm-hmm. And they've done, you know, the big band thing, the touring to make money thing, the, you know, putting out other people's records thing. Yeah. And now they're doing this because they love it. And that's why we're such a good combination. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, passion, that I get. Mm-hmm. you know um and i know what to do with it mm-hmm. so they're doing a ton of interviews they're doing a um 
they're doing, you know, a lot of social media stuff. They also like edit videos and do graphics and, wow. you know, and so we're all working really hard towards a goal. Mm -hmm. And the goal is not being a big rock star. The goal is being able to do this mm -hmm. for a living and to keep being able to do this. That's so well said. And, you know, um, I completely agree with everything you've mentioned. And it seems that, um, you know, wrongfully many people associate success specifically with, you know, uh, progress with career progress, which is, you know, a fair that's also point. relative that's yeah. also relative to who you are and where you are. You could be a working musician mm -hmm. and make your living off playing covers in your local market. Mm -hmm. And that's success. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's uh, because to me, you know, success is being defined in terms of to achieve uh, what you wanted to achieve and do what you want to do and, you know, j just be fulfilled by that. Uh, well, it always changes also what you want to do. My true. initial goal was to be a vice president at a, a, a major record label. I mm -hmm. did that when I was 31. Mm -hmm. What do I do now? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, and th that's an interesting topic because. Um, you know, I, I guess, and I sort of experienced this myself, is that when you set yourself a goal and you achieve it, um, after that, you get into this sort of, for me personally, you know, demoralized state where you are like, well, I've achieved that. What's next? You know, wh what I need to dedicate myself to now. Have you, have you experienced that? I think you, I think the question becomes, why am I doing this? Interesting. You yeah. know, and, and how can I derive pleasure and, and how can I de derive results from myself mm -hmm. from what I'm doing? And like me, I want to help musicians achieve their dreams. Mm -hmm. I'm doing that every day now because I'm working with independent artists and I'm helping them release a record like, you know, like some major artists are doing mm -hmm. independently, you mm -hmm. know? I do a lot of release planning with people, not only PR. Mm -hmm. And now I'm making resources, people I know, available to people that never would have had access to them in the first place. Yeah. And that's what I derive pre pleasure from in what I do. That's, uh, you know, it makes all the sense, you know, just to get yourself back to the core of everything and just, you know, sort of. Um, seeing the bigger picture, I guess, in the end of the day, rather than being lost in the daily routine of it all. Yeah. I mean, I've had my titles, I've ha you know, that I wanted. I've done the superficial things. Mm -hmm. I've been to award shows. I went with Slipknot the year they won the Grammy. Wow. You know, I, I, I've done that all now. Mm -hmm. And now it comes directly back to why am I doing this? Would you say that at this stage you were, you know, completely satisfied with what you do and how everything is unfolding in terms of? I mean, if you're ever completely satisfied, get out of the business. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, it something motivates you and it's, you know, lack of satisfaction, mm -hmm. I think. But I want to see the band I manage be huge. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to see some of these people I'm helping mm -hmm. get to their definition of success. Mm -hmm. So, you know, am I satisfied? No. I mean, I'm satisfied with the things that I've done mm -hmm. and I feel that I've put my myself into them completely mm -hmm. and I've been honest with people mm -hmm. and I've never ripped someone off taking their money and not doing anything. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's satisfying for me mm -hmm. because I hate people that do that. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. <laughs> they give people like me a bad name. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's why I don't get as much money as I should get for what I mm -hmm. do, mm -hmm. because they're always assuming someone's going to rip them off. Absolutely. That's, and that's sad. Yeah. It's very sad because, and I see that as well, you know, some, especially independent artists and small level artists, they're so much used to being taken advantage of of people pretending to meet the expectations and to provide them with something that the trust issues that people in this industry have are so significant, I guess. I feel like it's easy to see, though, if you're being ripped off. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I feel like if someone tells you they're going to take your record and go off and make you a star and you just wait and see, Mm -hmm. that's your, that's the indicator that you're being ripped off. There's so many situations in the music business that it's full of those people that you've mentioned that are given, you know, the proper professionals a bad name. What you should look for is someone that wants to work with you. Yeah. Because you know what's behind what you created. Mm-hmm. And you're looking for a partner. You're not looking mm-hmm. for somebody who's going to take it, go away and do it. Mm-hmm. You're looking for a partner in, you know, bringing this to the audience that will love it, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and if someone's like, oh, we'll call you in a few weeks, big red flag. Yeah. Yeah. Just actually, you know, uh, it's completely right. It's just, as you've mentioned, sad that, I guess so many artists and passionate, you know, people um, are just, you know, um, are just being taken advantage of in, in a very. Well, but also, trauma. some artists are lazy and don't want to work. They want to give it to somebody who'll do it. Uh, that's very correct as well, and I, I see this as a tendency from the artist side as well. Is that you know we want to achieve the big results and we want to do that and we want to be that and whatever the case might be, but we're not really you know able to put the work in. And we are not ready to keep ourselves responsible for the lack of results, which, um, you know. I mean, uh, it's, it's a real partnership and, and the work has to be put in, you know, on social media. Mm. The work has to be put in, you know, in many other aspects of your career. And if you're not willing to put it in, mm-hmm. then how is just paying someone else to do something going to gonna be make you a success? success like success or whatever yeah. getting signed to a record label that's the beginning not the mm-hmm. end mm-hmm. that's uh that's very well said and it's you know I- i've always found it as um you know as a much as a mathematical proportion even like even if you have someone to do something for you you vastly uh improve your chances to make it happen if you also you know utilize your working potential And, um, well, they're not going to be around forever. Exactly. Exactly. You know? um, I prepare my clients for when I'm not around. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, are you, you going to leave? I'm like, no, it's not that I'm going to leave. Someday I'm going to leave. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's, just, that's just the way things work in life. <laughs> But, um, you know, I, I'm preparing you. You need to own everything that I do. Absolutely. Yeah. This you is know. knowledge that they're receiving is, as a result of your cooperation. So it makes sense. I mean, they're the captain of the ship. And if they're not, they're not doing it right. <laughs> Absolutely. Like based on, based on that, um, whenever you're in a situation where you have to choose, you know, the project that you're working on, the people that you're cooperating with, um, do you take this sort of, I guess, mindset and the mentality of, of the people Um, when it comes to your decision? Why is it important for you to make sure that you're working with professional, you know, uh, professional people with the right idea and work ethic? Or is it about just the final product? No, it's, it's the, you have to have somebody with the right work ethic. Mm-hmm. You, you really do. I mean, like in PR, it's got to be somebody who can do the interviews and mm-hmm. is willing to make the time to do the interviews. Because if you're not going to do them, why am I getting them for Mm -hmm. you? You know, um, and then in management, if they're not going to do work and it's just you, then I mean, how is there going to be promotional product? How is Mm -hmm. everything going to reflect their aesthetic if they're not doing it? You know, like when I have ideas for the band I manage, I send them a rough sketch of it, but I say, make it yours. They're incredibly creative guys. And and I'm always impressed with what they come up with. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I if if I don't have a partner in what I'm doing, doesn't make sense to do it. One of the best partners I have is Alan Robert from Mm -hmm. Life of Agony. Mm-hmm. he i work with him not on life of agony i work with him on his uh horror coloring book series wow that's so cool and he is such an amazing artist 
he is um he's a great guy and really smart and really knows his audience and i'm just providing opportunities for him to speak to them and he's the best like he like drafts his press releases he's like i mean and i don't mind doing that but he's like a great writer yeah. you know he's a really smart guy i learn every day i work with him i learn so yeah. you know it's great to have great partners and i really do uh, many campaigns that i've personally you know that personally made a big impression on me so, you know, I would love to hear, you know, your insight and the creative process behind them. Um, sure. One of them um, is, you know, a campaign that um, uh, the campaign for Jenny by nothing more. Correct me if I'm uh, wrong. Now, those guys have my heart. Yes. Like they are wonderful people. I, I mean, I'm still friends with them. I, I went to Louder Than Life and I saw them and I hung out with them and I, I just Every time I see them doing something great, mm -hmm. it warms my heart mm -hmm. because they are truly wonderful people, mm -hmm. great partners to work with, mm -hmm. and they give of themselves like emotionally to mm -hmm. their fans in a way that not everybody does. And in that Jenny campaign, like I, I've been involved with mental health causes before. Mm -hmm. And I introduced them to the Jed Foundation mm -hmm. and we went about doing that campaign. Johnny told me a story about his aunt mm -hmm. that, um, you know, she had a traumatic experience when she was younger and had a, a, a break kind of and, and had problems for years and years and years. And her name was Jenny and mm -hmm her his sister was named after her jenna mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she also you know had had mental health difficulties mm -hmm. and challenges and like a lot of people do that have these challenges that aren't as well informed about them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they deny them mm -hmm. they don't take their medicine they don't you know and and that's and there's like a stigma to it. So Johnny and I had a very deep conversation about it mm -hmm. and said, let's do something. And that launched the Jenny campaign and everything at the end of the video yeah. after the phone dangles. Yeah. That's all stuff I did. Amazing. I found the quote. I, I helped them with the organizations. And I have to say, I, I, that's that is one of my proudest moments. Yeah, I, I specifically wanted to ask you about this one because um, you know, firstly, um, this is this is the sort of projects I've seen in the music business that just feels so much more than you know just their you know a typical sort of video music release or whatever the the, the case might be, and. Uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to, you know, to speak with Johnny a couple of times about this particular case. Um, by the way, just, you know, a few episodes before having you on, I had also Mark. And he was um, explaining the whole process behind the campaign because I pretty much asked him the same question. Yeah. And I mean, those guys are so giving of themselves. Yes. The reason that a lot of, of music videos get to be so sterile and predictable yes is because people aren't willing to be open and and the guys are nothing more they are wide open and and that is what makes them so special and, and still to this day special to me mm -hmm. because they you know we were just of like minds mm -hmm. you know and and i i'm their biggest fan absolutely i mean they they really deserve it they they just feel so as you said, different. And I guess there is no Authentic. better one. It, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, have you, like, have you had, what are some sort of other similar projects that you worked on or you feel so emotionally invested with as well? I, I have to say that's probably the most emotionally invested I got at mm -hmm. that label. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually know. 
A second to that is Escape the Fate, who I'm still working with. Amazing. Um, Craig Mabbitt got sober over quarantine. Mm -hmm. And I was so proud of him. Mm -hmm. I I, want to not tear up. I'm starting to a little (laughs) bit. I was so proud of Craig Mm -hmm. and and the person that he became. Mm -hmm. And the role model that he became, mm-hmm. getting sober and talking freely about it. Mm-hmm. And I i mean, in a personal way, I am so proud of Craig Mabbitt. Like, he's fantastic. Absolutely. And he's renewed and his creativity is renewed. And he's got this great Twitch channel that I, yes. I'm like part of his fandom on his Twitch channel. <laughs> I'm always on there, Metal Flack, and I talk to him there. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, that like when I saw him for the first time in person since that, mm-hmm. we hugged for so long. <laughs> it was crazy. Like he also was so giving of himself. Mm-hmm. Like to his fans, to people Mm -hmm. who may be struggling with sobriety or or a lack of sobriety Mm -hmm. and 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 to stay the course and to make their lives better. And I mean, look at him. He looks gorgeous. He's like Mm -hmm. he looks better. He sounds better. He feels better. He's got a better relationship with his family. Mm -hmm. Like I'm super proud of him for that. And we did a lot of interviews about recovery um in tandem with this movie that they had a song in that was at the label i worked at yeah and and when i left the label they left shortly after me yeah so now we're working together again and <laughs> that's the best <laughs> amazing so, you, you've worked yeah. with them for for a couple of records right i did the hate me <laughs> record that one uh and i did another i i, I did two records with them yeah yeah uh, that's you know that that's such a good story as well and uh you know i'm very happy to 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 hear your approach towards you know these sort of um you know personalities and situations because it really you know showcase how invested you are in, in terms of the people that you're working with rather than just perceiving them as you know just a job thing i guess i mean they're what makes it special yeah you know And I I always wanted to stop just short of taking things personally, Mm -hmm. you know? And and I mean, I do in some cases because of course I'm human and you're going, but you know, I I do actively try to say, it's not about you. They probably didn't realize that you felt that way about what they said and move on because it's not worth fighting. Yeah. Because I, I have some friends that do fight. Mm-hmm. and do take it extremely personally and they're probably great at what they do for that reason mm-hmm. but my my reasoning is i love the people i work with i only work with people i love and mm-hmm. you know i even took on a rapper mm-hmm. as a client and i don't work in hip hop like and mm-hmm. i told him that <laughs> um i was approached by Zach Yoshioka who is also manager the, of, of the the Fate. Fate. yeah and and um head from corn mm-hmm. and they were like will you talk to this guy we're managing and i was like i mean i guess i'll talk to him but i don't really do hip-hop we spent two hours on the phone we really got each other mm-hmm. and we did a lot of recovery press i still don't do hip-hop mm-hmm. but we did some press <laughs> and um and he's now a good friend and you know, Noble Poets is the name of, of of them. And they're going out on a big tour now. And I mean, it's it's about quality people, working with quality people. That's mm-hmm. essentially my criteria. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, um, do you like um what's what's the thing in in a you know in a campaign that you've developed or on a project that you've worked on that you know makes you really happy and that makes you excited you know what's what's part of the process that you really enjoy and subsequently what's the what's the thing that you know makes you happy for it once it's done i mean i think launching a song and this is like new to me because of course i'm i'm managing for the first time now 
But yeah. launching a song, like when we launched all the pretty things first single teenage lines that i mean i felt like i was in the band you know yeah. <laughs> like and we were so excited and it was such a thrilling thing and we you know I, and i mean like i worked on like getting press getting playlists getting this getting that and like you know that was thrilling to me mm -hmm. now Press wise, the thing that I'm glad it's over when I do it and it's over is tour press now because all of these great editors that used to be all around the country are getting mm -hmm. fired. They're losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, people at newspapers, sometimes newspapers don't even have an entertainment editor anymore. So trying to figure that part out, that's the part I like the least. This makes sense. This makes sense. Um, you know. I like, what are you what are you currently listening to like what's your favorite music right now it's gonna sound like promotional but <laughs> literally i started working with them because i love their music uh all the pretty things we just released a single on wednesday called every now and then and i literally listen to it on repeat amazing and i'm doing this because i love it so much I'll, I'll definitely um, check that out too. If that... All the pretty things is one word, mm -hmm. um, and on socials it's all the pretty things official. Mm -hmm. And I, literally, I listen to that and their first song all the time. And beyond that, I usually listen to '80s stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, '80s and '90s, like some EDM, some rock. You know, a lot of alternative, like Depeche Mode and stuff like that. But I, I do listen to all the pretty things, like, regularly. Um, you know, it, it, this, is, uh, this is something that I always, uh, I, I'm always interested to hear perspective from people from the music business. Um, considering that, you know, music is not just your passion, but your, you know, your profession as well. Um, do you get to a point where you can't enjoy music as a fan because you're so much overwhelmed by it through your profession and that you're sort of, you know, uh, losing the, you know, just losing the feel to it. Or do you manage to sort of distinguish the both things? I don't listen to music a lot at home. I do a lot of podcast listening. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that frustrates me because I'm like, my band should be on this podcast. But <laughs> yeah. I, you know, and, and sometimes I read a magazine and I go, oh, my band could have done that better mm -hmm. or, you know, something like that. But consuming media is very different when you work mm -hmm. in PR. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I read I read a lot of tech stuff mm -hmm. um, because I'm very interested in technology. Mm -hmm. And another client of mine is an immersive audio company. Oh. So I, I read about that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um and i mean my spotify top songs last year mm -hmm. were green noise so i could sleep <laughs> nice <laughs> they're like what kind of insomnia is this <laughs> like, <laughs> um you know I, I listen to green noise every night mm -hmm. but um and you know and i listen to a lot of retro stuff i'm on twitch quite a bit mm -hmm. Twitch, I, I, there's a lot of DJs on Twitch that I'm a fan of. And almost every night of the week, I, I would be on Twitch listening to, you know, people play stuff from like the 80s and 90s. And, you know, that, that was my era. Yeah, this, uh, you know, this, uh, this sounds perfect. I'm, you know, I, I actually, I can definitely relate to that because one of my most listened things is also, you know, rain sounds <laughs> to, yeah. to when I go to sleep. Yeah. That, that also, like, I, I want to say 2021, r rain, you know, rain on the window was like yeah. a first played song. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can completely, I can completely relate to that. Uh, you yeah. mentioned that you're listening to a lot of podcasts. What sort of, you know, other topics you're interested in outside of music? I'm very True curious. crime. True mm, crime is yes. it, man. Yes. I was listening to a podcast mm -hmm. and I heard the guy from the podcast talking about being a fan of Five Finger Death Punch at the time that I was working with Five Finger Death oh, Punch. Oh, wow. 
Now I'm friends with Paul Holes, the guy that caught the Golden State Killer. Oh, wow. Because we bonded over Five Finger Death Punch. <laughs> oh, wow. Whoa. Di okay, so this is an entirely different topic because true crime for me is, I'm so fascinated by it as well. Uh, do you, well, I, I, I don't even know how to formulate that exactly, but do you have a, you know, a specific serial, serial killer or case that you're most fascinated by in terms of, you know, just um, following or researching or whatever the case might be? I mean, that changes a lot. And I also listen to podcasts about con artists. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating to me as well. Mm -hmm. There's, um, you know, there's a lot of podcasts that I listen to. I mean, I feel like everybody is interested in finding out what happened to John Bonet Ramsey, but yes, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's not like something I'm obsessed with. Like uh, the golden state killer case. Mm -hmm. I have read a tremendous amount about that. And it was before I became friends with Paul and mm -hmm. after. Wow. And, and Paul's got a cool book out now too, that I got to listen to. I do a lot of audio books. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like I, I listened to last podcast on the left Mm -hmm. I listen to my favorite murder. Um, I listen to Scam Goddess, which mm -hmm. is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of comics that do some true crime stuff mm -hmm. these days. And, um, you know, and I, I really, I enjoy it because it takes me out of my daily life. Yes, yes. And I like puzzles. Oh, puzzles. Interesting. So, I mean, not physical puzzles yeah, yeah, yeah. but like, like solving things yeah, yeah so like i'll listen to like unsolved ones and then i'll think about how i would have done it you know what i mean yes it's it's great brain exercise listening absolutely to uh, absolutely um so uh, you know you've always mentioned uh, you've also mentioned that you're like into anime and you mentioned comics too um, yeah. Tell a bit more about that because I'm again I'm very interested to hear your you know interest in that. I have a friend who runs one of the bigger comics blogs, oh. and she was like she was my neighbor when mm -hmm. I lived in Manhattan, mm -hmm. and um, she recommended me to work with these people who ran regional comic cons because I wanted to get into that world mm -hmm. because I'm kind of obsessed with it. Oh. Um, I've taken my nephew to New York Comic Con since he was three mm -hmm. and he's 11 now. Um, and we go every we go. Well, the last couple of years we haven't because of the pandemic. But, um, you know, we would go every year. And I just I love the comics world. It's like the world of misfits, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'll uh, say so like, do you have, you know, a, a, a favorite series or like... Um... I am a collector. I collect Wonder Woman memorabilia. Oh, wow. When I, I'll show you at the end. I'll yes, you. please. I would love to hear that because um, I'm definitely not a big collector. I do have some, you know, uh, interesting things, but I'm nowhere near that. Um, I, I, because I, you know, I decided I don't want to go to that route because otherwise... You know, I'll need to spend everything I have on that. And like Funko Pops, for instance, I'll only buy the bands I've worked with. Mm -hmm. So I have Stuart Copeland from The Police because I did his band Gizmodrome. Um, I have Motley Crue because I worked with them and I had Slipknot because I worked with them. Oh, wow. Uh, speaking speaking about Motley Crue, I'm jumping again. Sorry about that. But uh, It's okay. Um, I, you know, I've always been so fascinated by Nikki Six. Uh, and, you know, I recently on the podcast, I had um, Joseph Scott from Saliva. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was telling me so, you know, so many amazing Nikki Six stories. Um, did you, you know, I assume you had the chance to interact with him and, and so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah, I mean, in the beginning of the pandemic, he refused to learn how to use uh, Zoom. So we had a very <laughs> hard time getting interviews done. Oh, wow. But apparently he's learned it and is using it now. <laughs> um, but, I, I, you know, there's always like when you're working with a band, there's always like the one person that like that you click with the most. Yeah. And with Motley, it was Tommy for me. Okay. Yeah. 
he's so joyful and mm-hmm. like nothing like these stupid series that are made about him. Mm-hmm. Um, like he, you can't be in the same room with him and not be smiling. Oh, he's like he is like a fountain of joy. <laughs> he, he he really seems like that because I remember, you know, as a, as younger, one of my favorite all time. TV shows was the one where he went to college or whatever the case might be. Yeah. And he just he was like the best guy you want to hang he around. He was with. perfect for that because he's genuine. He doesn't know how to be phony. It's just <laughs> not in his makeup, you know? Yeah. He's genuine and lovely and wonderful. And I I, I enjoy him so much as a person. Mm-hmm um you know and we we bonded over similar music we liked um because i like edm a lot too and Mm -hmm. he's very into that and now he's very into his bonsai and you know he's he's wonderful i really i'm i'm a super fan of tommy like as a human being that's that's great i mean he really seems uh very natural and authentic as you mentioned Um, yeah and, you know, to, to get back to the geeky stuff, I guess, uh, in terms of like comic cons and stuff like that, do you have like, you know, um, a situation where you've met someone that you that you've made a really big impression on you from this world? Um, you uh, know, I met Stan Lee once and that was pretty oh, wow. spectacular. Wow. Oh, mm. wow. That's a big one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting this one. And I was like a big fan, like mm-hmm. fan growing out. Uh, I met William Shatner oh, like wow. on the phone and, yeah. and I scheduled interviews for him, um, which was very cool too, because of course I grew up watching Star Trek. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of artists, you mm-hmm. know, and it's wild because Alan Robert is so into that world too. Oh, wow. And when he went to art school, one of his teachers was the guy that created Thor. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So we geek out about that like constantly. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. This is, this is a big one. Yeah. This is a big one. And uh, my clients, Man with a Mission, did the theme song for My Hero Academia. Really? Mm-hmm. Is that them? Yeah. That's why I wanted to work with them. Wow. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Jesus, that's a that's a big one. I've I've never I really love that song, by the way. <laughs> you know, I've never really thought. And you know, it, what's wild is like I, I worked um WinterCon, which was a Long Island based mini, you know, regional Comic Con. I worked Big Apple Con mm-hmm. for a couple of years and that was crazy. And then I worked uh, a show called Selling Heroes. Um It was an online television thing. And it was this guy who was a big collector. Mm -hmm. I got him in Forbes, I think, about collecting comics. Um, You know, and there's so many cool things out there. I mean, I also, the guy that owned Roadrunner also owned a book publishing company Mm -hmm. and did a lot of music-related books. We did a Kanye West coloring book. (laughs) That's an interesting one. And then there was there were some you know biographies and there were there were a bunch of books on Bob Dylan that I got in Rolling Stone and uh, Pantera that I got in Revolver and mm-hmm. you know and and oh and I I worked of course uh, with Vinnie Paul uh, rest in peace I think it was his birthday yesterday he would have been fifty nine um, and and I worked with him in Hell Yeah or two records and uh you know we we would also talk about like comic-con type stuff and he was a huge kiss fan oh wow so uh you know there's always there's always something that someone is passionate about other than music Mm -hmm. that can put them in a space where they're the only ones Mm -hmm. like they're the only musician talking about fishing you know, and I remember opposite, yeah. Tom and Hell Yeah was a big bass fishing fan. <laughs> wow. and bass Fisherman magazine took them out on a lake when they went through it on tour. That's that's such a good and interesting angle, by the way, you know, 
to well, you know and, and you might be the only guy who is an authority on cigars mm-hmm. that is in a rock band mm-hmm. you might be the only guy who knows a lot about anime who's in a rock band you know and it's like that's how you put somebody in a place where mm-hmm. they can get more attention mm-hmm. absolutely yeah that's a that's a very good angle I um, sent Paul Holes to escape the fate show. And I was like, please take a picture with them, <laughs> you know, and I'll put it, you know, I don't even think he got there backstage or anything, but, uh, but yeah, you know, and I'm like, Oh, you know, all the true crime people will flip out, you know, it's so rare for me to, you know, to meet like-minded people that can explore different topics. So for me, this is, yeah. You know, I, I and people don't of... take themselves too seriously. Absolutely. And, you know, I've, I've actually sort of started the podcast because I found out that people in the entertainment are the people that I really click with. And I just, you know, enjoy communicating with, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of personalities. Okay. I, I won't, uh, you know, uh, take any more of your time because if I continue... We're going to talk again, you and I will yeah. definitely. Yeah, please. Uh, let's make it happen. I'll be, I'll be very glad to, uh, I'll be very glad to do so um and uh yeah thank you so much for your time that was so much fun and yeah. um i'd love to I, I you know personally for me there are so many topics that i would i would love to explore with you but um yeah Next time uh, for sure definitely yeah let's do it let's uh let's keep in touch and um and I, I would love for you to meet my guys. I, you know, Worth Weaver is in All the Pretty Things, and mm-hmm. he's a producer, and he used to be in He's Legend, and he's a fascinating guy. I would love for you to meet him. Um, I'm all up for that. Like, um, so even if you want, to, you know, um, any people that you have in mind that you're working with that are just genuinely interesting to, you know, to oh, have yeah. these sort of discussions, feel free to, you know, let's arrange it genuinely like yeah uh, i mean like i believe in this band just so much that and i know anyone who meets them is gonna love them mm -hmm. so i'm just trying to get like all of my friends to talk to them because Mm -hmm. they're just i went down to north carolina and i went in the studio with them and i mean they're the greatest okay yeah um I'm definitely up for that. So again, you know, let's uh, let's talk awesome. about that and set that up as well. Yeah, amazing. Thank okay. you for having me on. This was fun. Thank you. The pleasure was so mine. Thank you so much again. Um, let's keep in touch, and hopefully, I'll talk to you soon. We'll do part two soon. Definitely. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Have awesome. a great day. You too.